سلامة الله والله أسك الشيخ أدم يشو بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم صل على محمد عدد ما ذكره الذاكرون اللهم صل على محمد عدد ما غفل عن ذكره الغافلون اللهم صل على محمد في الأولين اللهم صل على محمد في الآخرين اللهم صل على محمد في الملأ الأعلى إلى يوم الدين أمسينا وأمسى الملك لله والحمد لله لا شريك له لا إله إلا هو إليه النشور سينا على فطرة الإسلام وكلمة الإخلاص وعلى دين نبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى ملة أبينا إبراهيم حنيفا وما كان من المشركين اللهم أنا أمسينا منك في نعمة وعافية وستر فأتم علينا نعمتك وعافيتك وسترك في الدنيا والآخرة اللهم ما أمسى بنا من نعمة أو بأحد من خلقك فمنك وحدك لا شريك لك فلك الحمد ولك الشكر يا ربنا لك الحمد كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك وعظيم سلطانك رضينا بالله ربا وبالإسلام دينا وبمحمد صلى الله عليه وسلم نبيا ورسولا أحبتي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته طبتم وطاب ممشاكم وتبوأتم من الجنة منزلا بإذن الله ثم أما بعد First of all I'm really glad and happy to be with you tonight for the second time, yesterday I was the khatib here for Salat al-Jumu'ah and I thank you so much for your uh, generosity and for your hospitality and for your uh, eagerness and desire to you know, seek Islamic knowledge. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all being among those الذين يتبعون الذين يستمعون القولة فيتبعون أحسنة اللهم أمين As uh, uh, Sheikh Yahya indicated that will be a uh, 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 all about zakah for Muslims in the U.S. Uh, this is not a, a, you know, a contemporary issue when it comes to zakah, but we have contemporary applications of zakah. We have new categories, different kinds of wealth, different kinds of assets. There's something wrong with the, with the sound system, is it? You have no idea? Right. So the topic, the topic itself actually is a, is a like a well-established and well-known one. And it's always connected with, with Iqamu Salah in the Quran for more than 80 plus, you know, uh, different places in the Quran. يُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةَ وَيَتُونَ الزَّكَاءَ وَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةَ وَأَتُوا الزَّكَاءَ So nothing new when it comes to zakah as a concept. But as I said, what's new here is like contemporary issues related to the application of zakah. Different kinds of uh, assets, wealth, business, how to calculate zakat al-mal, what is to be included, what is to be excluded. That, inshallah, will be our topic for tonight. And I will, I will try to limit myself to maybe, let's say, 40, 45 minutes, and then we'll open the floor for question and answer, inshallah. Let's start with, uh, with, with the zakat al-wealth, or even before zakat al-wealth. Let's make a very quick comparison between, between zakat al-mal and paying tax to the IRS. Zakat al-mal versus paying tax to the IRS. When you file for your, for your income tax, you start with the, with the total income that you have made. In 2021, for example, you made $70,000. You start the math with $70,000. Of course, like different deductions uh, you know, apply based on number of uh, family members. You pay for the mortgage of your house. You pay, I mean, whatever the category might be, right? When it comes to zakat al-mal, we do not care about, about the total income. What we care about is the remaining income, is the remaining income. So in our example, you made $70,000 last year, and whatever, whatever remains in the month of Ramadan, where most of us, not even all of us, calculate and pay zakat al-mal in the month of Ramadan, you found out that you have in your bank account, in your position, $20,000. You start the math with the 20,000. 
whatever you have like you know gained in the past whatever you have generated in the past money whatever you have spent in the past is not to be taken into consideration so you start with the with the remaining income not with the not with the total not with the total income another difference <clears throat> Another difference is that zakah actually is a, is a formal act of worship. It's one of the pillars of Islam. So you have to pay, you have to pay zakat al-mal regardless whether you live in the USA or you live in Somalia or you live in Canada or in Saudi Arabia. It doesn't make a difference, right? You have to pay it anyway because you are a Muslim. But when it comes to tax, you pay tax to the government here because you live in the, in the USA. So there is no intersection between the two, right? There is no intersection between the two. Some people mistakenly think that by paying tax to the government, I don't have to pay zakat al mal Well, there is no connection between the two whatsoever. Because the ways that, uh, that our tax money is spent has nothing to do with zakat. Yes, we do benefit for like from, from the tax money that we pay. And when it comes to zakat al mal in most cases, most cases, you cannot benefit from your money. You are either, either a payer, like a zakat payer, or a zakah recipient, or in very few cases, you break even. You do not pay zakah and you do not receive zakah from others. But in most cases, you cannot benefit from zakah to mal You cannot be a zakah payer and a zakah recipient at the same time. Is that correct? With very few exceptions, like zakah to fitr which, which is not our topic for tonight. But in zakah to fitr if you, if you have the ability of paying zakah to fitr then you pay it. And that, that zakah money has to be you know, paid to the needy individuals. If you are an needy individual who does not have whatever is sufficient for him, then you can receive zakat al-fitr after paying zakat al-fitr. Uh, <clears throat> as I said, zakat is to be paid on the remaining wealth. So forget about all what you have made throughout the whole year long. Just focus on the month of Ramadan, which is most probably the time where we start you know, calculating and paying our zakat. Whatever you have available, accessible, owned by you is where you start the math. You find out how much you have and then you start you know, doing the math accordingly. There is no way to waive anyone or to excuse anyone from paying a zakat al -mal. No one even has the authority of like waiving or excusing anyone from paying zakat. When it comes to tax, right, the, the, the government does have the authority of waiving or excusing or discounting you know, the, the tax for some people, it's not the case when it comes to, when it comes to zakah. Zakat al-mal, like the zakah rate, is a fixed one. Okay, if you're talking about zakat al-naqdain, al-dhahab wal fidda cash money, right? The currency, the, the, you know, the cash that you have. It, it's 2.5% zakat rate, regardless of how much you have. Regardless of how much you have, whether you have 10, thousand dollars or you have ten million dollars it doesn't make any difference so it's not a progressive one when it comes to tax and you know in this country and maybe in like uh, you know some other countries it's a very progressive one right it depends on the on the on the bracket that you are in or within right if you if you make less than let's say thirty thousand you are tax free from thirty to fifty you pay only five percent from sixty uh, and so on and so forth so it is a progressive one when it comes to zakat al mal it's just a fixed fixed one 2.5%, no more and no less, regardless of how much, how much money you have. Now let's move on with, with the zakatable wealth. What is to be included in the month of Ramadan? What kind of assets or money or wealth or you know, enterprise or business you need to take into consideration to pay zakat al -mal? Okay, The first and the most important category that all Muslims actually are included is the cash money that you have. The cash money that you that you have, cash money could mean uh, cryptocurrency, believe it or not, could be cash money, could be documented money that you already documented to the to, to, to the IRS, could be undocumented money, which is something illegal by the way, it could be money that you have in your checking account, in your saving account, although opening a saving account is not a halal option, but this is not our topic. You do have some money in your saving account, in your checking account, cash in hand in your pocket at home with your wife, with your kids, all the cash that you have, 
and regardless of the reason behind holding the cash. Even if you have cash money for saving purposes, you did not perform hajj yet, and you want to save for your hajj, right? If one complete year, like, you know, fiscal lunar year already passed, Sani Hajriya, passed already on the money that you have, and you have an isab, the threshold, which is something that inshallah I will explain, then whatever money you have is the category, you have to pay the counter. Someone is still single and you know, is saving for his marriage, right? Still, you have to pay zakat. Someone is saving for the education of his kids, making some, some saving you know, to pay the tuition fees for his kids. That's zakatable money. Someone is saving for purchasing a house to live in, not for business purposes. That is still zakatable. All the money that you have, stimulus checks that you have received from the government during uh, COVID-19, uh, unemployment payment, income tax return, you filed your tax, you get some you know, money back, that's to be included included in your zakah calculation. There's something called uh, virtual wa'a'u uh, zakah. Wa'a'u zakah actually is the virtual pool of zakah, where you put in all those different kinds of assets and then you make your math, you find out how much, you know, how much zakah that you have to pay. All the stocks that you have are to be included in your calculation. So stocks are stocks in the, in the stock market, okay? All the financial instruments that you have, even if you have other than, other than stocks that are to be included, right? Regardless whether they are haram or halal, that's different discussion. Some people might have derivatives, some people might have uh, uh, bonds, uh, uh, futures, uh, options, all these like non-halal option for Muslims. If you do have them, the principle itself, not the profit or the haram profit that you make is to be included. So again, any kind of stock, any kind of uh, retirement account that you might have is to be included. This actually does not mean that all what you have in your 401k is to be included, but I'm, I'm saying that this category is a zakatable one. So you need to have in mind how much you have in your 401k, 403b, pension plan if you work for the government, whatever you have actually is to be, is to be included. Uh, <clears throat> Another category called the business zakatable wealth. Now the first one is for everybody. The second category, the business zakatable wealth, is for business people, people who are making money. The bread makers, as you say, right? What kind of business you have? What kind of business you have? Some people might have a, like a professional service, right? Professional service like, like, a, like a physician, a surgeon who has his own practice, a consultant, an engineer, uh, an attorney, for example, who does not have actual assets like, you know, to sell or merchandise, but he or she, like, you know, sells his, you know, intellectual ability and, uh, and, 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 and serving people, right? Giving the knowledge and the expertise that he has, the, the, that he has for, you know, for, for, uh, for a compensation, right? That person actually has to consider all the money that he makes from that business. You have your own engineering firm, law firm, all the, the, like the legal fees that you charge to your customers are to be, are to be included. Some people uh, might be professionals working for companies, receiving, receiving uh, checks, right? Paycheck uh, every two weeks or monthly. All the money that you receive, all the money that you receive are to be taken into consideration. Some people actually are merchants just business people, they have, let's say, a grocery store or a uh, car dealership, right? All the grocers, all the merchandise, all the, all the goods, all the commodities, anything that is for sale, right, is to be included. Anything that is not for sale is to be excluded. You have furniture, you have tools, you have devices, you have machineries, you have software, you have hardware, you have surveillance cameras, you have AC system, whatever you have to run your business, as long as those items are not for sale, they are to be excluded. Whatever is for sale is to be included, including, including the display items, like some car, you know, car dealerships, they might have a display item, like a very brand new car, a fancy car, display item. It's not for sale for the time being, but it's just a display item, that's to be included. Whatever you have in your uh, inventory and in the storage is to be included. Everything on the shelf, right, for sale is to be included. 
how to calculate how to calculate the value of the business that different discussion but I'm, I'm now counting different kinds of business how about those who have uh, what is called technically exploited assets for example you have a, a, a like a taxi cab right taxi cab and you provide transportation service you generate money generate money out of providing transportation service that money that you make uh, is zakatable you need to include it in your zakat you know, uh, calculation you might have some rental properties you have an apartment okay or a condominium or a house for rent the the the, the lease revenue the money that you make rent money lease revenue that you make out of renting or leasing that apartment is to be included okay uh, a medical lab for example you provide like you know blood work uh, whatever money you make actually is to be is to be included so this is when it comes to business of course agricultural products are to be included but for us Muslims in the US I mean we do not care that much about uh, right like the farming business live stock if you have which is again I mean not something that we really care about uh, different kind of, of, of businesses actually you might have a you might have a product and you have a source of the product okay you might have a product and a source of the product there is no way there is no way that you have to pay the care on both on the source of the product and the product itself take for example farming business you have you, you have like zuruah and thimar like crops and and, 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 and and fruits and vegetables and so on and so forth you do not you do not pay zakat on the on the on the agricultural land itself but you pay zakat on the on the fruits on the vegetables that you have right someone has a business like makes honey from from bees bees actually are zakat exempt nahl but you have to pay zakat on the profit that you make out of producing uh, uh, honey dairy from livestock you have 500 700 1000 cows okay not for business purpose i mean you do not like slaughter and you sell meat but you produce dairy products, milk and cheese and butter and so on and so forth. Right? You pay the cow on the profit that you make from the dairy products and you do not pay the cow on the, on the cows in this very particular scenario. Right? So my point here is that there is no way where you have to pay the cow on the source of the business and the product of the business. It's either, either or. Take for example, eggs from poultry. Even if you have more, more than 10,000 chicken, for example, there's a cow example. But you need to pay zakah on the profit that you make out of producing eggs and selling, selling eggs. Silk from silkworm and uh, so on and so forth. So the, the, the qaida here, qaida or the standard here is that zakah is potentially due. Zakah is potentially due on all products whose sources are not zakatable. It's either or. Prophet ﷺ said, لا ثانية في الصدقة. لا ثانية في الصدقة. No like duplication and taxation. It's, it's, it's either or, right? And when we say either or, it's not by choice or by desire, it is by the delil, right? By what the Prophet ﷺ indicated or by what the fuqaha you know, concluded from uh, the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Anything that you own, not for a profit motive, for your personal use, the clothes that you have in your, in your, uh, in your closet at home, the house that you live in, the car that you drive, the furniture that you use, utensils that you have in your uh, you know in your kitchen right uh, food stored in, in 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 the pantry all different items that you utilize or use for your good self or for your family members okay without having any profit motive behind it that's a zakah example even if you have more than what you need even if you have more than what you need as long as again those items are not for sale not for profit then they are zakah exempt. Of course, as a practicing Muslim, you are not supposed to lead an extravagant lifestyle. Right? So you are not supposed to lead an extravagant lifestyle. If you if you need three cars for yourself and your wife and your you know son, you don't, I mean it's not a good idea to have five or six cars. If you need only two thousand square feet house, it's not a good idea to have five thousand. I mean this is israf. This is israf. However. Even if you are a Musrif, even if you are a Musrif, that extra properties you have are zakah exempt. You have two different houses, one of them here in the U.S. where you live in, and the other one overseas. 
okay? As long as the other house is overseas, that's overseas, as long as it is locked throughout the whole year long, okay? It's not for rent, it's not for sale, it's for your personal use whenever you decide to go vacation, if you decide to go, right? If that is the case, then the other house that you have overseas is a zakah exempt as well, and so on and so forth. So residence, food, uh, uh, transportation, all these like different categories are zakah exempt. As I said, the tools, the devices, the uh, uh, instruments and the equipment that you use to run your business are zakah exempt because they are urud tijara. I'm sorry, they are not urud tijara. They are not commodities or merchandise for sale. So anything that is technically defined as urud tijara is zakat. Anything else that you utilize to run your business, right, or to protect your business, right, or to operate your business, that is zakah, zakah exempt. Property and public trust, anything that is not privately owned, right? You have an orphanage, you have hospital for the county or for the state, you have masjid, mashallah, or Islamic center that might worth millions of dollars, right? It is zakah exempt. Any kind of waqf endowment for a, a, a zakah free project is zakah free as well. Let's say that you decided one day to buy a waqf to support your Islamic center here. That waqf, that piece of land or apartment complex or business is zakah exempt. Why? Because the beneficiary, which is the masjid here, is zakah, is zakah exempt. Allah forbids if someone, you know, gets involved in any, you know, haram business or a haram way of generating money. If someone made some money out of, uh, like, bribery or, or, or cheating or fraud or monopoly or interest, that haram money is not zakatable. You have to make sure that you dispose that money, okay? Dispose that money in a sense that, that if it is a, like a, you know, a bribery that you charge to other people, you need to pay that money back to the legitimate owner if you know him. If you do not know him, you just dispose the money on behalf of that individual. But you cannot keep that money and pay zakah on it because zakah actually is to be, is to be charged against the halal wealth. The haram money actually is still haram. It cannot be purified by 2.5%. In order for yourself to clear your record with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have to pay 100% of that haram money, which is, you know, to get rid of the money or to dispose that money. So uh, interest is to be disposed, right? Anything that, as I said, like out of bribery or out of embezzlement or forgery or fraud or whatever, uh, if you know the legitimate owner of that money, you need to pay it back. Otherwise, you just dispose that money on behalf of the legitimate owner. I mean, just to keep your record clear with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who is supposed to uh, pay zakat al-mal? Of course, Muslims, because non-Muslims are not addressed by, by, by ahkam al-sharia, right? Reaching the minimum threshold, which is the nisab. Now, the nisab that we need to uh, uh, know here is uh, nisab al dhahb which is an 85 grams of gold. This actually means that if you pay your zakah in the month of Ramadan, in the beginning of the month of Ramadan, you need to do some, some homework. You need to find out how much is the gram of gold. Of course, the 24 karat, right? If it is uh, sold in the market for $50, right? 85 grams of gold, the nisab, according to the Sunnah of the Prophet uh, uh, times $50, that's 4,250, right? Let's make it 4,500, uh, I mean, just uh, simple math. This actually means that if you do have net amount, not a gross amount, net amount of $4,500, then you have to pay zakah, net amount. What's the difference between gross and net amount? You ended up having $20,000 in the month of Ramadan. However, you do have $3,000 payment for your house, $500 you know, for that particular month for your car, another 1,000 more or less for the furniture, for the appliances, uh, outstanding balances, debts, okay, uh, uh, unpaid tax money to the to the government. You keep deducting, deducting all the way until you went below 4,500. Well, you are zakah exempt for that year. You are zakah exempt for that year because the net amount that you have does not reach any sum, and you have to do the same exercise every single year because you know the, the value of the gold fluctuates, goes up and down. So in the, in the zakat due date, you need to find out 
how much is the, is the nisab in American dollars? It could be 4,500, could be more, it could be less. If the net amount that you have is reaching the nisab or more, then you have to pay zakat. Uh, misunderstanding here, some people think that if the nisab is 4,500 and you have uh, $15,000 net amount, not to gross net amount, they think that you, that you, you drop the nisab, you, you exclude the nisab, and you pay zakat on the rest of the money, which is wrong, right? And in our example here, in our case, you have to pay zakat on, on the 15,000, not on 10,500 and you drop the rest, okay? And nisab actually, the use of the nisab is that it determines eligibility, right, of paying zakat. If you, uh, here is the nisab, 4,500. If you do have a nisab or more, you pay zakat on everything. But if you have less than the nisab, then you are zakat exempt for that particular, particular year. Now, the status of the individual himself, like the owner of the, of the property or the asset, is not to be taken into consideration, which means that if the, if the wealthy individual is like mentally challenged, he or she is like not mentally stable, right? Or for example, an orphan, or a very minor, like very young, right? That person actually still has to pay zakat, not by himself, through his legal guardian or the person who is taking care of him. Could be like a wealth manager, financial advisor, a guardian, whatever the status of that individual might be. But there is no way for that individual, for that minor or the insane one, the one who is mentally challenged, to be excused, okay? What is the difference between salah Siyam and Hajj from one side, Zakah from the other side. Why do not we ask you know, minors to pray? We do not mandate them to pray. They do not have to fast in the month of Ramadan. They do not have to perform Hajj. Is that correct? Okay, how come that they do not have to pray but they have to pay Zakah? Difference is that those Ibadat are physical Ibadat. Hajj, Siyam, Salah are physical actions. While Zakah is a financial Ibadat, right? Zakah is a financial event. Where did we get it from? From the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, when he was addressing the, like, the legal guardians and the financial advisor or the wealth managers of the, of the orphans. He said, Go ahead and invest, invest, okay, in the property and the assets of the yatim that you are taking care of lest it is consumed or devoured by the sadaq, which means that the yatim has to pay zakah, but not by himself through his legal guardian. Now for the wealth itself, for the zakatable asset, in order for it to be zakatable, it has to be exclusively owned okay, by you. Uh, in our example, the, 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 the threshold for this year, the nisab, is 4,500, right? And you have... Uh, you have a, a very small business of only $8,000 jointly between you and your business partner. You own only 4,000 and he owns only 4,000. Do you have to pay zakah on your share? You do not have to. If this is the only thing that you have, you don't have to pay zakah on it. Unless you go with the madhab that this is a partnership, this is like a one project and it's worth 8,000, then zakah is mandated on the business itself regardless of how you know, how big or small your percentage of ownership, regardless of the method. But generally speaking, if your portion of that business is less than Nisab, right, and this is the only thing that you have, then you don't have to, you know, worry about paying zakah on it. The second condition is ability of growth, actually or potentially, which means that the property itself that we are talking about has to be for business purposes, some way, somehow. As an example, you, you have a house that you live in for your personal use, homestead as they call it. That house is a care exempt, is that correct? After a while you change your mind, you just move to a different, different place and you, you, you put a sign on that house that you are living in uh, for rent. Okay. As long as that house is rented, making money, you have to pay zakah on the lease revenue. You don't have to pay zakah on the market value of the house. Why? Because the house is not urut tijara. It's not for sale. It is not for sale. It is for, 
for rent. So far, so good? Okay. You rented that, that you lease that, that house for two or three years, and then you change your mind. You just removed for rent, and you put another sign for sale. Oh, that's a completely different story. For sale means that from that point on, the house became urud tijara. It is for sale. No difference between the house and the, and, and the chips and the snack and the soda that you have in your grocery store. Everything is for sale, right? So from that point on, you need to consider paying zakah on the market value of the house because it is for sale. Even if it is not sold within one year, even if it is not sold for one year. So you can easily now see the, you know, the whole picture that the same house in the first scenario when you were living in it is zakah exempt. Why? Because it's not a, a potential, it doesn't have a potential ability of a growth. You're not making money. Simple as that. I mean, this is your, 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 your home estate, your residential property. And then when you moved and you put it for rent, you started paying, you know, zakah on the, on, the, on the rent, on the lease revenue. And the, when you change your mind and put it for sale, you started paying zakah on the market value of the house. You see? So it depends, Allah. It depends on your intention and your practice as well. Your intention and your practice as well. Question. How about the, the long-term investment that you might have? We usually like, you know, purchase a piece of land and we just sleep on it five, 10, maybe 15 years until our kids grow, okay? With the intention, with the plan that whenever my kids go to college, I will sell that land and just, you know, spend, uh, like cover the expenses of my, of my kids, right? If that, is, if that is the intention and that is the practice, which means that you're Land is off market. It's not, it's not marketed. It's not listed in the website and you have a real estate agent waiting for, no, none of the above. It is off the market, right? It is a long-term investment. So for the time being, it's not for sale. Well, if it is not for sale, then it is zakah, zakah exempt, right? Once you change your mind and you put that, that piece of land in the market, then you have to start, you know, calculating zakah based on its market value. You put it in the month of uh, Shawwal of last year. In the month of Shawwal of this year, even if it is not sold, you have to pay zakah on it. Why? Because it became urud tijara. We said several times, whatever for sale is urud tijara. Thus, consequently, it is, it is zakatable. This is actually based on, 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 on fatwa or the madhab of Imam Malik, anhu, who, who does differentiate between a tajir al-muhtakir والتاجر I forgot the term that they use. Uh, التاجر المدير here you go. التاجر المحتكر والتاجر المدير. التاجر المدير is the active merchant, is the one who buys and sells you know, periodically, almost every day. Whatever he buys, he puts it you know, for, you know, for sale. That's تاجر المدير, right? تاجر like active in the market. التاجر المحتكر is the inactive merchant, is the one who buys a property or a piece of land and just, you know, put it aside, sleep on it, as we say, for a few months, a few years until the price goes up. Of course, without monopoly, without, like, you know, you know hurting others or harming others. I mean, just a strategy, you know, you know to run his business that's different from a tajir al-mudir. So as long as he's a tajir al-muhtakir, then he doesn't have to pay zakah on that, on that land, okay? If you keep paying zakah, on a piece of land that is not for sale. You, you might end up like paying the whole price of that land, zakat al-mal, without even like benefiting from it, which is like a very bad business. So do not, do not pay zakat on it if it is, it is a long-term investment. Only if it is active in the market, you pay zakat. If it is off the market, you stop calculating uh, zakat. So exclusive ownership, ability of growth, passage of one lunar year. Passage of one lunar year means that you as a zakat payer have to pay zakat al-mal once a year. But this does not mean that every single payment you make okay, has to be staying in your position for one complete year. I'll give you an example. You have your own professional business, right? You work as an attorney. Every single day almost you receive like payments from your clients. You are a medical doctor, a, a physician. You have your own iyada, your own office or your own, your own hospital, for example. Every single day you receive payments from your patients. 
differently. If you want to go with the literal understanding of Hawalan al Hawl, it means that you have to keep track, keep track of every single payment that you receive. And you wait for one complete year and then you pay the cow on it. Which is <laughs> which is which is impossible. I mean you're gonna end up having more than three hundred zakat due date, right? This is absolutely incorrect. Hawalan al Hawl means that if you have a major source of income. This is your main source of income, okay? The, the practice that you have, okay? And most of the income that you have is coming from that source of income, right? You work as an attorney, that's it, no more and no less. So all the cash money that you have in your account, okay, uh, is coming from where? From your practice, right? If the nisab is established, which is most probably the case, you do have $4,500, right? If the nisab is established, whatever, whatever, like cash you receive on top of the nisab will be taken the same rule of the nisab itself. We call it al-mal al-mustafad, like the gained or the extra, the extra money. So do not worry about the cash flow that you experience throughout the whole year long. You receive money every day, honey and Mary and halal. Use the money bil ma'roof without, again, without being a, so extravagant, without you know, wasting your money, spending your money wastefully. Forget about, you know, calculating or, or tracking the money. Forget about it. Just in the month of Ramadan where you set your zakat due date, find out how much you have in your account and you pay zakat on all what you have after deducting everything. Let's say, for example, that in, in, in the beginning of Ramadan, you found out that you have $50,000. And after deducting everything, you, you, I mean, you, 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 you ended up having $40,000. And then you found out that, oh, 10,000 out of those 40 were deposited just, just yesterday, two or three days before the beginning of Ramadan. Do you still have to pay zakah on that what check of $10,000? Do you still have to pay zakah on it? Yes, because that is, that's al-mal al-mustafad. That money actually came from the same source of income. So it has to be taken the same rule of the, of the nisab that you have. All what you have, regardless of how long that money has been deposited, your account. Even even if, if you if you have uh, some money deposited one or two days before the beginning of Ramadan, that's to be included. This is actually the definition of al malu al mustafa. Just make sure that you have a nisab. Nisab is there. Whatever you have on top of the nisab will be taken the same the same rules of the of the nisab. You pay zakah on everything that you everything that you have. One of the conditions is uh, having access to the wealth. What we call it in, 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 in fiqh term, al mulk al tam raqabatan wa yadan. Min shuroot al wujub al zakah, al mulk al tam raqabatan wa yadan. Raqabatan means that, that raqabatan means, means uh, legal ownership. You are the owner of the car, you are the owner of the 401k. Yadan means access. So the property has to be owned by you and it has to be accessible to you. Okay? What if I do have, what if I do have a source of income or a saving account or retirement account? That's my money, but I do not have an access to it. Like for example, for example, 401k, right? So whatever you have in your 401k is yours, whether, whether it came from your deduction or the match of your employer. At the end of the day, whatever you have in the account is your money. Is that correct? The problem here is that you do not have full access to it you are not supposed even to withdraw that amount because, I mean, 401k is to be saved, Allah forbid, like for, in case of disability or otherwise uh, sudden death or otherwise like, you know, reaching the age of retirement. So you're not supposed to touch that money. However, you do have an access, you do have an access to that account some way, somehow. If you apply for, uh, sometimes they call it hardship or humanitarian case, Okay, it depends on the policy of your employer and the policy of the investment company that runs your portfolio, Fidelity, Vanguard, right? So let's say, for example, that, that, that if you decide to withdraw as much as you can, as much as you can under the category of, you know, hardship or, or uh, you know, humanitarian case, you will be having an access to 50% of your portfolio. If the total value is 100,000, to keep it simple, okay? And you want to withdraw as much as you can, so the, the, the accessible amount will be how much? Accessible amount, 50,000 our example, right? 
50,000. If you decide to proceed, Jazakallah khair, If you decide, if you decide to proceed, you will not be taken home 50,000. You will be penalized, you will be charged interest, processing fees, penalty, sometimes tax, right? So you do all the math. You do all the, all the math. And by the way, this is a, 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 like a very theoretical calculation. You do not have to physically withdraw the money, okay? You just ask yourself a question. What if I decide to proceed? How much I will be taken home? That, that taken home amount is the zakat of the way. That taken home amount is the zakat of the Is this the only opinion that we, we, we have? No, we have three different schools here. Some like mashayikh and ulama and, you know, in this country here believe that you have to pay zakah on all what you have in your 401k. You have $100,000 every single year in the month of Ramadan, you pay zakah 2,500, Anything that you have actually is zakah. Now this is one extreme. Now the other extreme, other extreme is saying that, well, you do not have an access to this account. So forget about for your 401k, even if you have millions of dollars, that's a zakah exempt. You wait all the way until you retire, and then you start paying zakah, which is way, way too extreme, right? Now, in our opinion, by our actually, I mean Majma Fuqaha al Sharia, I mean Amja, the Assembly of Muslim Jews uh, uh, in, uh, in America, right? We say, well, let's hold the stick from the middle. We do not say that everything is zakatable, and we do not say that everything is zakah exempt, okay? We say, you pay zakah on the withdrawable amount, on the accessible amount, okay? Every single year, you need to do some, some due diligence, some, some homework. You find out how much you have, how much you have, or how much is the value of your, like, 401k portfolio, $100,000. If you decide to withdraw as much as you can, how much you will be having an access to? 50%, right? So the, the withdrawal, withdrawable amount is, 50,000. Are you following up with me here? From those 50,000, how much you will be taken home? Maybe just, just 40, 45, after like deducting the penalty and the tax and the, you know, what else, processing fees and, and, and so on and so forth. So the net amount actually is the zakatable one. The net amount is the zakatable one. Now we have two different options. Either to be in the safe side, to be in the safe side and to pay zakat, 2.5% on that net amount. Or if, if you want to deduct another maybe 15, 20% from that net amount, go for it. Because that 15 to 20% reflects what's called the usul al-thabita, like the fixed assets, right? The fixed assets, like the property, the machineries, and, and, and the furniture that, you know, that company has. Because the stock that you have does not reflect, you know, uh, merchandise and commodities, you know, 100%, right? it does have certain percentage of fixed assets, and that is zakah exempt. So you deduct another 15, 20% and you pay zakah on the, on the rest. What if you, what if you think that, that Amja, you know, position is a, is a reasonable one, and you did not, you did not pay zakah on your 401k for the last 20 years. Do you have to backdate, okay, backdate your zakah and you go all the way Okay, find out, you know, how much you have to pay zakah. You do not have to. Please do not do that. Okay, do, do not do that. Because our opinion as MJ is just ijtihad. I mean, I mean, this is our, our like, you know, personal, uh, you know, or, or independent reasoning, our ijtihad. We might be right, we might be wrong. But what you can do is that from now on, from now on, you can apply our fatwa. Every single year, the month of Ramadan, you find out how much you have, how much access you have to, how much the net amount will be, and you, um, you, you calculate your zakah accordingly. Of course, if you want to pay zakah on everything that you have in your 401k, I mean, you can, right? There is a huge difference between, between do I have to pay zakah on my 401k in full versus can I pay zakah? Well, you can. In fact, you know, the more money you pay as zakah, the more reward you will be getting, right? But this does not mean that you have to pay zakah. Again, the reason behind this, you know, this, this you know, uh, uh, restriction is that you do not have an access to your 401k in full. This is a very restricted account, restricted kind of business. 
okay, for a purpose. I mean, the, the government wants to help you keeping you know, as much money as possible for investment purposes. So whenever you retire, you will be having a good source of income. So when you, when you withdraw from now, you violate the spirit of, of your 401k, let, let me put it this way. Moving on, there is something in, in this country called the, the poverty line. Poverty line actually is, a, is an economic governmental standard to determine eligibility of people receiving certain support from the government. If someone is under poverty line, then he or she is eligible to receive certain financial support. Could be food stamp, could be tax exempt, could be, I mean, whatever. Some people think that if someone is under the poverty line, 2022, then he is a, a Zakat recipient by default, and vice versa. If someone is above the poverty line, then he is a Zakat payer by default. Well, there is no connection between the two. You might be under the poverty line, and you still have to pay Zakat, and you might be above the poverty line, and you still can receive Zakat on that. Someone makes $80,000 a year. But he, of course, I mean, this is way above the poverty line, right? But he has, let's say, two college students. For some reason, they did not get any scholarship, any financial aid, and he barely, barely can afford paying for their expenses and for their tuition fees. Sometimes, actually, he runs behind. Is that person an eligible zakah recipient? Yes, he is. Can he apply for zakah while making eighty or $90,000 a year? Yes, he can, because his legitimate expenses are more than his uh, income. You see the point here? So it depends on your income and your legitimate reasonable expenses. Legitimate reasonable expenses. Moving on. So salaries and professional fees are covered. How about jewelry and ornament? Do you usually pay zakah for the jewelry of, uh, of your wives here? Do you usually pay zakah? If you pay zakah for the jewelry of your wife, please raise your hand. You can, you can pay zakah, and I would encourage you to continue paying zakah, but if, if you ask me a question, do I have to pay zakah? You see the difference? Do I have to pay zakah on the jewelry of my wife? My answer actually is no, you don't have to. This is actually a well-established, you know, uh, khilaf, between the four different madhab regarding the zakat ability of the jewelry, right? The vast majority of the uh, subcontinent uh, brothers and sisters, like from India, from Pakistan, from Sri Lanka, from uh, uh, Bangladesh, from Kashmir, they are like a strict Hanafi followers. They follow the, the school of thought of Imam Abu Hanifa, radiallahu anh. And according to this madhab, jewelry actually is zakatable. That, that's why they keep you know, paying zakat, which is good. I mean, continue, keep up the good job. I'm not here to discourage you from paying zakah. But if you ask me a technical question, fiqh-wise, do I have to pay zakah on the jewelry of my wife? My answer actually is no. No, you don't have to pay zakah as long as, number one, the value of the jewelry of your wife is within the average in that society. Within the average. If the average nowadays is 20, 25,000, if a sister has $100,000 worth of jewelry, well, that's way too much. The first 20, 25,000 are zakat exempt, while the rest actually are zakat. And number two, that jewelry is for her personal use and not for profit motive, not for business purposes. I know some spouses actually, like husband and wife, they are on the same page. They keep like buying and selling jewelry throughout the whole year long. You just keep, you know, watching the news whenever the price goes up. They sell what they have whenever the price goes down. They just go ahead and, and buy jewelry. If that is the intention and the practice, then all the jewelry, all the jewelry, as long as it is 85 grams or more, all the jewelry that your wife okay, has is zakatable because this is a business and not a you know, jewelry for the person use. You see the difference? So within the average, within the average for, for a personal use, and by the way, w w when we say personal use, it does not mean that your wife has to use those jewelries like every single day. Well, 
even even if she uses like uses them once a year, only occasion whenever she has a party or hafla or or zawaj or whatever, that would be fine. As long as that jewelry is designated for her personal use, that's more than enough. She doesn't have to pay zakah on it. Some people who prefer to pay zakah one you know one time to hold the sick from the middle, go for it. But again, technically, fiqh wise, you do not have to pay zakah on the jewelry of your of your wife. <coughs> When it comes to investing in the, in, in the stock market outside your retirement account, forget about your 401k if you work for corporate America or 403b if you work for non-for-profit organizations or for educational uh, organizations, forget about your pension plan. By the way, if you work for the government, the state or the federal or the county, usually you receive a pension plan, not 401k. Is that correct? And to my knowledge, you do not have an access to your pension plan. There is nothing called a humanitarian case or, uh, or hardship. Even if you apply, you cannot receive anything. Is that correct? Well, if that is the case, if that is the case, then you do not have to pay zakah on your pension plan. You don't have to. So you can just sleep on that account for 10, 15, 20, 25 years until the age of retirement. Why you do not have, why do not you have to pay zakah on your pension plan? Because of, because of lack in access. I mean, you do not have an access to it. You see, so, so well, alhamdulillah, we are consistent in the, the fatwa. Whatever accessible is zakatable, simple as that. Whatever accessible is zakatable. Even if it is proven that you do have an access to your 100%, your 100% uh, amount of your 401k, well, 100% of your 401k actually is zakatable. Of course, after deducting all the penalties and the tax and the interest and so forth. Financial instruments, stay away from those derivatives, CDS and CDO and, and options and, and, and futures. Limit yourself, limit yourself to uh, stocks that belong to halal business. This is in general. In particular, not every single, not every single stock belongs to Microsoft or to Apple is halal. You do not know that those companies actually do have a side business. You do not know how much debt actually they have. There is a certain criteria, there are certain criteria to be taken into consideration. Maybe for like, you know, common investors, it's hard for us to determine. So you need a kind of support or consultation with some professionals in the industry to tell you how much halal and haram involved in that, in that stock. There is a free service by a company called Atina. You can Google it, Atina, A-A-T-I, N A A from the word Rabbana Atina fi dunya hasan. Atina A A T I N A A dot C O not not dot com dot C O. This is an an Islamic investment company, and I'm the Sharia consultant of that company. So I know for fact that you know their business is halal and their investment actually is good. They do actually offer a free service, which is a, a, a search bar. You go to the search bar and just enter the name of the company that you want to invest in and click enter, it will show you like a very short report whether or not that stock matches the criteria of Atina. They do not call it a Sharia compliant, they call it Atina compliant. I mean, just, you know, you know, for some diplomatic political reason, we don't use the word Sharia, right? So before you invest, you can just enter the name of the company that you're interested in and you find out. This company actually is very conservative, very conservative when it comes to halal and haram. So, I meet with them f four times a year. Every single quarter of the year, we meet together, and we see a database of maybe more than 12,000 different financial instruments in the stock market. From those 12,000, we just end up having maybe 800 up to 1,000 only halal, halal or sharia compliant stocks. And the rest of them are to be excluded, either because the core business is not halal, uh, or otherwise the debt asset ratio is too high, like they have more than 30% debt loans, right? Or maybe they, they have more than 30% interest bearing investment, like 30% of the value of the stock is money deposited in saving account. Or otherwise maybe they, they generate more than like more than 5% of, of the revenue, they make it from interest. Whatever the reason might be, 
any any reason out out of whatever I mentioned is more than enough to drop that 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 option. So from 12,000, we end up having 800, 900, 1,000, sometimes 1,200 maximum, and the rest of them actually are just to be to be excluded. So this company, by the way, does not give you the option of. Uh, investing with them. You cannot open an account with them and ask them to invest your money, right? What they do is you uh, subscribe with them. You pay them, I think, 15 or $20 a month as a, as, a, as a subscription, and they keep sending you either text messages or emails. We sold this stock. We bought this stock, which means that it's up to you. This is what we have done, and we are sharing our experience with you. If you want to make money, just follow us. So from your like TD Ameritrade app, you just go and sell whatever they sold and buy whatever they bought in order for you to make you know to make money. Now this is one option. The other option is called Zeki Financial. Zeki Z A K I, ZekiFinancial.com. This is another mutual fund company, and I'm the Sharia consultant or advisor of that company, so I know that their business is halal. Now those guys actually do offer you. Uh, uh, halal investment, which means that you can open an account with them, you deposit five, ten thousand, whatever, and you ask them to run your account. They, 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 they take care of it. So two options, either atina.co or Zeki Financial, one word, zekifinancial.com, and you, uh, you, you invest with them. Now, when it comes to Zekia on stocks, which is our topic for tonight, now, we know very well how to handle the retirement account, right? What if you have something outside the retirement account? Unrestricted business. It's not, it's not 401k where you do not have an L. It is accessible 100%. You have a, a brokerage account, simple investment account, AGMA, for example, for the minors of your kids, 529 for the education of your kids. What else? Uh, IRA, individual retirement account. All these different accounts you set your own portfolio and you decide you decide how aggressive you want to be in the in the stock market to keep it simple keep it simple if you have a if you have an investment in the stock market outside your retirement account right and you are active in the market either by yourself or by others like for example if you have a mutual fund account it means that someone else is doing the business on your behalf. If you have a mutual fund account, the mutual fund company does not sleep on the, on the stocks. I mean, they keep trading, you know, day and night to make some money. Is that correct? So you are active in the market indirectly because someone is doing the business on your behalf. Fiqh-wise, if you are active in the market, then you have to pay zakah on the stocks and their dividend as well. Why? Because the stocks in this case are counted as Everything you have is for sale. Remember, everything that you have in the, in the account is for sale. That's urut tijara. So you have to pay the account. If you are inactive in the market, you open an account, simple investment account or, or you know, a brokerage account, but you are not that active. I mean, you do not buy and sell on a regular basis. You are just happy with the dividend of those you know, stocks. If this is your common practice, then you do not have to pay zakah on the stocks. You pay zakah on the, on the dividend. Because this is actually a very similar, identical case to uh, uh, zakat al-mustaghallat that we mentioned in the beginning, exploited assets. You remember the, you know, the one who has a taxi cab? You pay zakah on the, on, the, on, the, on the money that you make. You remember the one who has a rental property? You pay zakah on the lease revenue. Because the property itself is not for sale. Stocks here are not for sale. You just make money out of, out of you know, putting them in the stock market dividend, like growth or, or uh, profit. So if that is your common practice, then you pay the cow on the, on the dividend only and, and forget about the... Once you change your mind and you start becoming active in the market, you buy and you sell and you watch the news, and every day you go to uh, like Yahoo Finance and you feel your like blood pressure goes up with the index and goes down with the index, if this is what you do, then you have to pay the cow on everything. You have to pay the cow on the... <laughs> you like it, right? You, you pay the account on the stocks and the dividend of the, of the stocks. Okay. Yeah. 
all the payments, all the payments that are due are deductible when it comes to zakah. We our zakah in the month of Ramadan was 50,000. But you still, for that particular month, you have to pay $3,000 rent or mortgage for your house. Mortgage is not halal, but you already purchased your home like through a traditional mortgage, right? And your monthly payment is, is 3,000. 3,000 from those 50,000 are deductible, right? 500 for the furniture, 500 for the car, for the appliances. You did not pay your uh, tax in full to the IRS. Everything, whether that transaction or that payment is a halal payment or otherwise, doesn't make a difference, right? A very good example is the mortgage. Mor mortgaging a house by default is not a halal option. But if someone already mortgaged his house and his monthly payment is 2000 you deduct only the payment of that month. Some people think that, okay, if the outstanding balance or the, or, or the total balance that I owe the mortgage company, let's say, is $300,000, right? And I do have $300,000 cash, which is via or zakah, okay? They say, well, since I owe the mortgage company 300000 and I do have 300000 then I'm zakah exempt. Well, this is, this is incorrect because those $300,000 are due within the next... 20 years, right? And if you want to consider to consider the, you know, the, the future debt, why do not you consider the future income from now? I mean, to be fair enough, why do not you pay the on the potential income that you will be making from now, uh, and for like 15 or 20 years from now? So, so this is absolutely incorrect. You limit yourself to whatever is due in the month of the zakah itself, in the month of Ramadan. How much you owe the mortgage company? 3,000, you put them aside. IRS, 5,000, put them aside. Outstanding debt or loan that you have to pay for your credit card for whatever loan. Every, you, you, put every, you deduct another three, three to 4,000 dollars for your personal expenses, right? For your like, you know, transportation, your food, your groceries, uh, regular expenses for your family members, utility bills, put everything aside. The net amount is the, is the zakatable one. Now for, it's, it's, it's almost 10 o'clock. Do you want to uh, stop here and just uh, take some, some questions? Until, because the, the, the Iqama will be at 10.10, uh, at right? طيب. Should we, should we break and, and, and just take questions? طيب, تفضل. تفضل. Pension plan? Is this organization a business or a charity organization? organization. What, what kind of organization? Business? Well, if it is a charity organization, then the money that they have in their account is not zakatable to start with. No. Because the charity organization, actually, they, they represent the zakat payers and the zakat recipients at the same time. They are the third party in between. Even if they have hundreds of thousands of dollars in their bank account with no restriction from the government, still that money actually is not. Because actually zakat is a due on the property and the money that is privately owned. And this is actually a public fund. It's not privately owned. Yeah, regardless of the fluctuation. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. Even even if the market value of the of the stocks that you have went below the nisab, right? As long as the zakat due date is not there yet, then forget about the fluctuation of the market value. Just just focus on the on the on the value of the stocks or the portfolio that you have in the zakat due date, regardless of the history, whatever happened in the past, we do not care about it. In the zakat due date, do you still have nisab or more? If the answer is yes. Okay, the second question. Are you active or inactive in the market? I mean, forget about the retirement account. Active, you pay the account everything on the stocks and their dividend. Inactive, you pay the account dividend only. No, once once you go beyond the nisab, then then. Once you go below the nisab, no zakat. Once you go below the nisab, no zakat. Well, what you have is not 85. What you have is 85 minus 2.5%. So next year, if this is the only thing that you have, then you already went below the nisab. No zakah, no zakah. So let me take more questions from you. Tadala. And I can't hear you, I'm sorry. Well, there is no zakah. Well, for her personal use means that that jewelry is designated for her. It does not mean that she has to use the jewelry every single year. That's, that's the meaning of personal use, right? They are not for like sale, not for, there is no profit motive behind it. So she does not have to use that like every single piece of that jewelry periodically to keep it, you know, for her, for her personal use. No, that jewelry is for her personal use. As long as it is within the average, not for commercial purposes, no. There's a cat exam. It's, it's, a, it's a very disputable, uh, you know, issue between the four madahib. And I can use, you know, the same argument by saying, well, even the furniture that you have could be liquidated. Even the car that you drive could be, you know what, even the house that you live in could be liquidated. All right? But the standard here is not the, is not the you know, liquidation uh, ability. The, the standard here is the use. I do not see any difference between the jewelry that my wife actually has versus the clothes that she has versus the furniture that we have versus the house that she lives in. I mean, all these different items are for our personal use as a family. However, if you want to like pay zakah on jewelry, go for it. I mean, the more you pay, the more reward you'll be getting. But technically, fiqh-wise, you do not have to pay zakah on jewelry.
it is it is the catable, but you need to establish a new hawl for it because this is a very irregular income. Inheritance, for example, someone from your relatives, la samahallah, passed away and you inherited money. Well, that, that, that money came from inheritance is a very irregular income. That's different from the money that you make from your CPA or accounting practice. Whatever comes from your CPA practice is your, is your regular income. And your zakat due date is the month of Ramadan. Okay. Let's say that you received that, that insurance settlement or insurance money or inheritance or whatever compensation okay, from, you know, for a reason that has nothing to do with your, with your uh, CPA practice. Okay. You received that money in the month of uh, Muharram. You wait until the month of Muharram of next year and you pay the account if you still, if you still have it. So you establish a new hawl, new hawl like fiscal lunar year for that irregular income. Now, طيب, let me take more questions. Yes. I wanted to ask, um, I it depends on the level of monopoly. Is it, is it really harmful or not harmful? If it is harmful to the society, you deprive your customers or your clients from you know, purchasing whatever they want because you, know, you want to monopolize and to you know, control the price. If this is, if this is you know, the practice and the intention, then what you are doing actually is haram, is, is wrong. Based on that, whatever, whatever profit you make out of that ihtikar is haram. However, not every single ihtikar is haram. And I know some people like, you know, you know they buy uh, uh, olive oil, right? And they keep it. They keep it for months and months, maybe six, seven, eight months, especially like back home in Jordan. Because in, 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 in the month of November and December, uh, olive oil is available all over the country. And the price goes down, okay? And people actually do have, alhamdulillah, a lot of, a lot of uh, olive oil. So they purchase wholesale and they just store it. Until, until the month maybe of March or April, where the oil, you know, uh, olive oil is not that available like before. So they start offering what they have for a higher price. That, that would be fine. I mean, this is like a business strategy. I mean, you are not harm, you're harming the society or, or depriving the society from, you know, basics to live. Just a business strategy. Now, we have uh, three more minutes. For the iqama, is that correct? And I, and I, and I, and I forget to mention that, that when it comes to the eligible zakah recipients, fi sabilillah for the cause of Allah, according to Majma' Fuqaha Shari'at or Fiqh Council and different Fiqh Councils, that as long as there is a need, as long as there is a need for the Islamic centers and Islamic projects to receive your zakah money, you can pay your zakah money to your own masjid your own masjid construction, for your own masjid operation, your masjid expansion, you can pay zakat al-mal to support any Islamic project, whether for education like guidance college, uh, for ibadah, for like youth activities like your masjid, any kind of organization that you believe it's a, it's a, it's a legit, legitimate one, there is a need for it, you trust the leadership of that organization, you go ahead and, 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 and pay zakah. When it comes to fee sabir, alhamdulillah, we have a lot of flexibility here. Okay. See what? So do not, do not make it like, like a default rule, make it the exception. Okay. We, we, we cover, usually we, we cover the expenses of our masajid and our like, you know, Islamic centers from the sadaqah and the donation. However, if we run short, we open the floor for zakat. So just you know, take a note of that, that if you decide, like if the, if the sheikh, Sheikh Yahya ask you to pay zakat al-mal, you know, to pay the, the, the monthly payment of the markets here, and there is no other, like, you know, source of, of income or donation, go ahead and pay your zakah in advance from now. Paying zakah in advance would be fine. Prophet Sallallahu asked his uncle Abbas radiallahu anhu to prepay his zakah, and he did actually pay his zakah two years in advance. So prepayment of zakah, if you know that your zakah, um, let's say approximately $5,000 a year, and your zakah due date is in the month of Ramadan, and your markets here, your, your Islamic center was in desperate need for your money before Ramadan. You can pay the 5,000 
5,000 with the intention of paying zakat al-mal from now. So you fulfill zakat al-mal and you help your Marcus, your, your Islamic center to, you know, pay for the, for the uh, land or for the, or, or for the building. I mean, just to make it, make it clearer. طيب, I will take uh, one more question. So, Well, if you, if you, if, if the main reason behind owning the livestock, cows or buffaloes, for example, is to produce dairy products, like for milking purposes, producing milk, then you do not have to pay zakah on the, on the livestock. You pay zakah on the profit that you make out of, uh, like, offering the, the milk, okay? And you don't have to pay zakah on, on the milk or the profit and the cows. It's either or. But if you own those cows for yourself, then definitely you have to pay zakah once you hit, uh, when you hit uh, once you hit, I think, 30, if I remember. Like 30, 30 hit count, then you start paying zakah on, on the cows as well. Yeah. Use your own discretion, I mean, you live in the USA, Arafat, and we all have to put our resources to establish more Islamic organizations and to make sure that our masajid and our Islamic schools and our Islamic colleges and our charity organization, our youth organization, political organization, uh, 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 civil rights organizations are, are strong, functional, capable to support us, Arafat. Uh, this actually cannot be done without without being so generous with those organizations. You do have some some blood relatives overseas in, in need, right? And you have your masjid here. So just try to strike a balance between the two. If your zakah is 1,000, for example, if I'm, if I'm in your position, I would put 500 here for my masjid and 500 overseas. However, if you decide to put all your zakah here, I cannot blame you. If you decide to send your zakah overseas because of the very desperate need of those like relatives or extended family members overseas, I cannot blame you. I mean, use your own discretion. Be as just, as fair as, as possible. I think, I think our time is over. Maybe some of you have, have already made uh, pledges for guidance college. If you, if, you, if you made a pledge and did not fulfill it, please go ahead and, and, and make your uh, donation. You can give it to Sheikh Yahya or to the office because they're going to collect all the fund and write us a check. And again, Jazakumullah khairan for welcoming me, for your generosity, for your hospitality. Barakallah feekum. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Shadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfirukum wa tubu alaykum. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahu Akbar, Allah.